Welcome to the Flock and Hive podcast, a place for curious minds to explore all that makes life so weird and wonderful. And this week... You could also use flowers to even apologize. If you wronged someone, you could give them hyacinth to ask for forgiveness um, or bluebells for humility. And so you could really kind of pair flowers together to kind of get a more complicated meaning, or you could keep things kind of simple. And essentially pretty much every emotion is being covered. So you could really find out really hidden and secret ways to communicate that way. We speak to Jessica Rue about floriography, the Victorian secret language of flowers. Hello, and welcome back to the Flock and Hive podcast. It is series two. I'm Lizzie. I'm Helena. Hello. Hi. Um, We had a little break. What have you been up to? Well, uh, lots really, but I guess the two main takeaways are I accidentally dyed my hair ginger and I discovered the meaning of life. How about you? (laughs) You have got a bit Jerry Halliwell. I have, and that isn't how I discovered the meaning of life, by the way. I was trying to go blonde. That's the last time I'd do it myself. I mean, how old are you? You're still trying to dye your hair blonde. Did you learn nothing from sunning? <laughs> um, I did promise myself at the age of 22 that I would never touch my own hair again. Um, but just, I, I broke that and I regret it. That's all I can say. <laughs> It looks cool, though. It's like honey and kind of rocky, quite um, Shirley Manson from Garbage. Love it. To be honest, I don't hate it. It was just a bit of a surprise (laughs) because it's darker than my original colour and orange. And I thought it was going to be lighter and blonde. So there we go. I, I actually dig. I dig very much. So was the meaning of life you found stop messing about with your hair? No, actually, sister, it wasn't. In a nutshell, it was a combination of Viktor Frankl and Tim Minchin and uh, Rangan Chatterjee and everyone who's ever interviewed. And that is, humans aren't here for a purpose. Um, Trust humans to think that we are here for a purpose, you know, when the world has been going for billions and billions of years. Instead, just fill it with brilliant things and make sure you don't regret anything at the end of it. Okay. there we are. Life wrapped up in two seconds. I think Tim Minchin said it better. But anyway, what have you been doing? Oh, I actually did do something quite major. I went to Ibiza on my own without the children. Well, with for a Hindu. But it was it was so great. Oh my god, Hindus in your forties are so much better than Hindus in your thirties. What made it so good apart from the fact that you weren't there with your small family? Well, I just think at this age, I think we're more um accepting of any boundaries of like not wanting to drink that much or not wanting to stay out that late or and you know like all the washing up was just always done (laughs) basically that I would say (laughs) and the whole being on a beautiful sunny island without the children who I had to stop myself missing I was getting so annoyed with myself it's like oh you know they'd love this thing I'm like shut just have a good time being yourself it was brilliant gosh that does sound glorious I don't really remember that sort of Party Club Five. Now I'm ancient, but good. I'm glad you had a good time. So this week's guest is Jessica Rue, talking about floriography. And when I first heard that word, I was like, well, it's obviously to do with flowers, but what more is there to say? But turns out there's a lot more to explore. There's a rabbit hole and I'm here for it. Well, I think anything secret language you and I were always going to quite like for obvious reasons, weren't we? Well, when you've got a sibling, having a secret language that your parents don't understand is pretty great. So we're talking about Avagov here, aren't we? You have a guess, Avagov, of course, we have a guess, Avagov. Yes. Plevagis, have a guess, Avagin, have a guess, 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 So we can both speak this. I don't even remember learning it. It must have just been something that I absorbed from you from really young. Well, I don't remember learning it either because it's it's a way of speaking rather than a language. Like you're not learning different words for different words. It's just, yeah, we're not going to give it away on the pod, are we? No, we're not going to give away how to do it. But, you know, it still still exists. Not that long ago, I heard a mum speaking it to her younger daughter on the tube thinking that no one could understand and I was like oh do I say anything I didn't what was she saying it was a conversation about phlegm so I kind of get why they would not want to have that in English I wonder if mum always knew 
Nah. Because that was a big mistake your husband made, wasn't it? He told us immediately that he could understand it. He's completely missed out on being able to eavesdrop and dupe us into thinking we could get away with sneaky chat. He dropped a ball there. He really dropped a ball there. But what I don't understand is he's the only male I've ever met in my entire life that has known how to speak of a gov because I thought it was very much a playground thing that was very amongst girls, actually. Can your children? They are, they've started to understand a bit of it because we stupidly explained how to say it. And so they now they're kind of working it out. Which, but it's nice. It means in the future that we can have those conversations. About phlegm on the tube. Yes, definitely. But it is funny you say you don't remember learning Avagov because I don't remember either. I just It just sort of arrived in my brain as far as I'm concerned. But the word of the week, word of the week, is actually xenoglossy. Do you know what that means? No, glossy, zen, glossy, uh, gl- anything to do with a glossary? Well, no. gloss, yeah, well, yes, it is because glossa is Greek meaning tongue or language, which is where glossary comes from. And xenos means foreign or strange. And so as xenoglossy or xenoglossy, xenogl- uh, pff, uh, however you pronounce that, is a term used to describe the phenomenon of speaking or understanding a language that has not been learned. Like when if you're speaking in tongues, like I guess <laughs> Harry Potter and parcel tongue would be a case in point, you know, that famous historical context. So it's knowing how to do something without learning it or just particularly talking a language? Speaking a language specifically or understanding it, yet you've never been taught. And you can see that this would happen a lot in mythology, which is why I think our references to it are now literary mostly, like like Harry Potter. Do you remember that story years ago where this woman had a brain injury, was in a coma for a while and woke up and could speak fluent Chinese having never been around it or studied it? I have heard something about that, actually. And that's where you're like, wow, what is is past lives a thing? Or another dimension where she sucked up into <laughs> an, a spaceship. But anyway, this chat was an eye-opener. I've never really been into flowers. I've, I've, I think it's because they don't feel very permanent, which is crazy because something doesn't need to be permanent to have beauty. If anything, it's more beautiful if it's fleeting. And definitely as I've got older I I appreciate it more. So Jessica Rue is an illustrator and a gardener amongst many other talents like she writes as well and she has produced this absolutely stunning book which is very kind of old world beauty and style and it's just a guide to some of the traditional meanings the Victorian meanings of plants and flowers. Some might call it a florilegium yeah (laughs) you want to know what that means? (laughs) Oh I, I already know no go on enlighten me yeah, no, it's a really lovely Latin word that combines floor for flowers and legere to gather or to read, I think, in, in Italian. Um, so it's like a small bouquet of literary delights, like an anthology of writings, small writings that are really beautiful. And a florilegium is perfect for a book called Floriography. So, yeah, I thought that was a way to sneak in another word of the week. Sneak. Yeah, but back to floriography. Here is our conversation with Jessica Rue, all about the secret Victorian language of flowers. Jessica Rue, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about flowers. Now, you have the seriously enviable ability to both write and illustrate is such a gorgeously rich, old world style beauty way. And one of your books recently really caught my eye and it was the one on floriography, which is the Victorian secret language of flowers. Mm -hmm. Now I really want to get stuck into that subject, but before we do, can you just tell us a little bit more about you and your work? Sure, so I'm an illustrator and a writer. I live just outside of Nashville, Tennessee um, in the US. And in addition to that, I'm also a gardener. Um, So I love plants. I love being outside, um, especially this time of year when it's time to really dig in and start planting everything. Um, And yeah, a lot of my work is inspired by history, mythology, and folklore. Um, So when I first stumbled across the Victorian language of flowers, it seemed so perfect because it combines all of the things that I love. So there's flowers, there's history, there's mythology all behind it. Yeah, I mean, I must say, um, looking at your website, it's it's like stepping back in time. I mean, there really is a renewed interest in these more esoteric subjects as well. And the way you Absolutely. illustrate, it really is like a bygone era. And I don't suppose there are many people doing that anymore. 
I mean, I hope there are more soon. Like, I hope people, you know, see it and get inspired and kind of think about the meanings behind things as well. Because there is so much there. There's so much history and mythology and interesting things. And floriography is certainly one of them. So Mm -hmm. can you please tell people what exactly is floriography and how did it originate? Sure. Um, So floriography is the term for the Victorian language of flowers. So essentially flowers in this era um, held certain meanings and they could be used as a secret means of communication. Um, So this really kind of emerged around 1819. Um, There's a book published in French, Charlotte de la Tour's Les Langages des Fleurs, which my French is terrible. Um, But essentially it really caught on in popularity and translations were published and floral dictionaries popped up all over the place, especially in England and in the Americas. Um, And it really became synonymous with Victorian tradition and culture. And a lot of those meanings, like I said, they come from literature, mythology, folklore, religion, as well as the shapes and the characteristics of the plants themselves. So it isn't just flower arranging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot more. It's it's a little secret history and a little secret language that, you know, you could convey emotions and especially in Victorian culture where essentially open and flagrant displays of affection were discouraged and open and flagrant displays of all emotions really were not commonly seen. Like people would not be wearing their heart on on their sleeve the way that they do today. Um, And so this is kind of a way to communicate, a way to share a part of who you are and what you're feeling in a really beautiful and alluring way. So how would they use that in Victorian times? Mm -hmm. Is it a case of like, would would a man who was on the hunt for a beautiful woman or was in love with someone choose a particular posy to have in his lapel or something? Yeah, definitely. It could be used that way. Um, And so essentially you could communicate concepts like, oh, I want to court someone. So you might give them a flower um, that would say that like a blush rose maybe or a cornflower, which means hope and love to try to say like, oh, I'm interested in you. Also, death and dying and mourning were such an important part of Victorian culture too. So you'd come across flowers like willow and marigolds that would be used to convey I'm in a period of grief and mourning. Um, And so, you know, you could give flowers as support for a grieving person as well, like chrysanthemum would be for condolences, um, cypress as well for mourning. And you could also use flowers to even apologize. If you wronged someone, you could give them a hyacinth to ask for forgiveness um, or bluebells for humility. And so you could really kind of pair flowers together to kind of get a more complicated meaning, or you could keep things kind of simple. And essentially, every flower had a meaning and pretty much every emotion has been covered. So you could really find out really hidden and secret ways to communicate that way. But how secret was this? Mm -hmm. I mean, what if somebody speaks a language and the other person doesn't? And so Mm -hmm. what if you've done something wrong, but the flower you've given them says like, do one or something, or I hate you, or you're ugly. (laughs) Surely that must have gone wrong all the time. I'm sure. And I feel like there is not a ton of evidence that this was being used to make like really complicated um, and secret messages, right? So like it wasn't really used by spies or anything like that or any like forlorn lovers trying to like meet at midnight and try to communicate like a place and time because that really would be impossible to do, um, especially because like we run into issues where flowers mean different things depending on what floral dictionary you're using or what time period or location you're in. Um, And so it does get complicated very quickly. Um, One way around that is that uh, flowers on stationery and calling cards were very popular and they would list the meanings of the flowers as well. Um, So if you go into antique shops now, you can still find a lot of those Victorian era, like Valentines and cards and things like that. And a lot of times it would have the meaning there. So there wouldn't be any confusion, Um, you know, so I feel like that is one way to kind of communicate that. Um, And then I think it would be a part where you would want to be carrying like the most recent flower dictionary and you would hope that they would also be carrying the most recent flower dictionary or it could be a thing where you could gift that to someone with a bouquet to try to really show them as well you know that this is what I'm trying to say I love that so they have Mm -hmm. to like work it out Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's really good for a shy person just to make sure that you know they're gonna get it so yeah 
so obviously it can be quite complicated, but are there any specific flowers that have always held like a universal meaning either Mm -hmm. in Victorian times or just across all cultures? Yeah, definitely. Um, So I know when we think about roses, we definitely think about red roses and Valentine's Day and love. And that seems to really be a long lasting one. Um, And a lot of the Victorians loved antiquity. They loved ancient Greece and Rome. And so a lot of the flowers come from different myths from ancient Greece and Rome. Um, So you have like the Proteus flower, which means change, which comes from the Greek god uh, Proteus. Um, who was able to change his form. And so if you know like a little bit of mythology, then you can kind of think about the flower meanings that way. Like what what are these names that come up? Um, Like Narcissus even with the daffodil. Um, So the legend of Narcissus was a handsome and proud hunter who fell in love with his own reflection um, and perished by looking into the river and only caring to see what he looked like. The legend goes that a daffodil bloomed to mark his grave. And what's also interesting in, during the Victorian era is that there were Victorian flower hunters who were traveling the world and bringing back specimens from all over. And so a lot of times those meanings from other cultures would be carried back as well. Um, so when we think about orchids being elegant and beautiful in the Victorian language of flowers, they also meant that in Asian culture as well, where they came from. Um, as well as marigolds being used in Dia de los Muertos celebrations in Mexico. Um, And when that flower came to like England and to America, it it still held that meaning of grief and mourning and celebrating the dead. And what is the weirdest message you can get from a flower? Are there any really hilarious combinations that you've come across? You can definitely get pretty spiteful, which I think is fun and it's interesting. Um, I personally like the idea of just making like a, a flower arrangement that has like all of these kind of mean meanings, it just as maybe like a healing process for yourself to make after the end of like a bad relationship or the end of a friendship or something like that. Um, but there were some like tansy that mean you make me sick. Um, which is just, it's great. It's also a plant that, you know, you do find in gardens a lot. It's a companion plant for potato growing. And so you would see this in people's gardens um, in the era, like, but, you know, it, it did have this other meaning, um, especially because if you ate a lot of tansy, it would make you sick. Um, and so sometimes like the actual use of the flower would influence the meaning as well. That's great. And I can imagine that that would really suit English people as well, especially when we were even more uptight back in Victorian times. You could be really passive aggressive with it, can't you? Like, here's a flower. I hope you get sick. (laughs) Watch out, enemies. You'll be getting bouquets from me. (laughs) So can you share some famous examples of floriography that might have been used in literature or art? Mm-hmm. Or any anecdotes about it, especially from history, because, yeah, it's just such a beautiful subject. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one that's very, like, iconic for the Victorian era would, would have been the orange blossom. Um, and they're really the ultimate Victorian flower for love. Um, and it all traces back to Queen Victoria, who was the trendsetter for the era. And when she married Prince Albert in 1840, she had a headdress of orange blossoms and her dress was adorned with the flowers as well. Um, And so they're a beautiful, like sweet smelling flower. And it really became a symbol of love between the two. And so, you know, you can actually trace that flower's association with eternal love to ancient Greece. Um, When Zeus married Hera, it was said that she was given orange blossoms by Gaia, the ancient goddess of earth and fertility. And so it kind of pops up, you know, throughout time and culture And even Shakespeare would use flower meanings in his plays. Um, In Hamlet, there's the famous Ophelia flower speech um, where she says there's rosemary, that's for remembrance, pray you love, remember. And so those things would get referenced back in the Victorian era. And even today in pop culture, we do see the language of flowers pop up every now and then. There was that show, Enola Holmes, that came out, and it is based on a book as well. And even the wardrobe choices in the show reflect floriography and flower meanings, and it becomes like a major plot line. Um, Character names in books like The Hunger Games come from floriography as well. And I know as someone who loves going to museums and looking at art, Um, when you know a lot of flowers and their meanings, you you kind of start to see them 
in the paintings. And it, you kind of wonder, like, is this a reference to the actual meaning of the flower? Is it not just a decorative thing? And I know as an illustrator and as like a woman who loves flowers and, you know, beautiful, pretty things, I like to think about that. And I like to think that, you know, these beautiful things can have like deeper, sinister and secret meanings. That's true. I've never thought about it like that. It's mm-hmm. just, it's a whole other level to yeah. art that you can look for. And yeah, there's one painting that I love. Um, it's by Anthony Frederick Augustus Sandys, and it's called Love Shadow. It's a beautiful pre- pre-Raphaelite painting. Um, so it's this beautiful red-haired woman, and she's biting a little posy of flowers. And one of the flowers in this little posy is a forget-me-not. And so it's, you know, obviously this painting of like a scorned lover and it's, it's just a stunning painting and there's so much emotion there. And I just love that you can see these little flowers and think, oh, was he referencing this flower, the forget me not and thinking, oh, well, clearly she's been forgotten and she's forlorn about it. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) It's it's all these little clues. Yeah. Um, Have you been aware of anyone in, in modern times? Mm-hmm. sending messages with flowers. I asked that because I haven't found much information about it, but when, when the Prince and Princess of Wales got married, apparently mm-hmm. in Catherine's bouquet, there were some very specific flowers in there for meanings. Have you heard of anything else like that? I remember hearing about that as well. I thought that was so beautiful and special too. Um, I've heard of some florists today who offer that Um, It is tough, though, because you run into problems of flowers not being in bloom at the same time and just meanings of general filler flowers. Some of them are pretty negative, like basil is used a lot um, in filler flowers and bouquet, and it means hatred. And so, yeah, so you kind of have to like think about those kinds of things as well. And so it becomes pretty difficult to put together a bouquet, um, which is why I think it, it's, it is less popular. And then I think people do get sad if their favorite, favorite flower has a negative meaning, which is understandable, but there are a lot of negative meanings out there. And so there has to be a flower to match them as well. And in your book, Floriography, Mm-hmm. Um, which arrived one minute before we turned on this video. <laughs> yes. So actually what I'm seeing is it's like, it's a beautifully clear description on every page of a certain flower and what its meaning is, what its origin is and what to pair it with as well. Yes. That's such a great yeah. idea. Oh, so like, yeah. So like a couple of different ones. So I've, I, funny enough, I've opened it on orange blossom, mm-hmm. which by the way is one of my favorite smells ever. Yeah. And I, I live on the Isle of Wight where Queen Victoria oh. used to holiday And Mm -hmm. I'm about to go to the Ventnor Botanic Gardens to see what's going on there. And I'm sure there's going to be like, if it doesn't smell of orange blossom, I'm going to be quite upset. Yeah, (laughs) I hope it does. (laughs) So you've given another two options to pair with each Mm -hmm. and a stunning illustration as well to go with it. Thank you. Just circling back on florists that do it. Now, I know you're based in Tennessee. Do you know Mm -hmm. anyone there that does it? I think I saw that you collaborated with someone recently, didn't you? Yeah, my local flower shop down the street. um, I live outside of Nashville in a little town called Gallatin. um, And literally down the street, because I live in the historic district in there in downtown, um, is a flower shop and they do bouquets based on floriography. Um, So I got to do a little class and talk with them and explain you know, my background and what I learned doing it. And then at the end of the class, we all put together little bouquets, um, which was really fun to do and really a lot of fun. And they're a great little flower shop. Um, And I love that they're interested in that kind of thing as well. But they were lamenting about basil being, you know, such a common greenery like filler and not being able to use it (laughs) and having to come up with some alternative options. Yeah. Well, I mean, what other surprises are there in terms of a beautiful flower that means something awful? I know petunias also have a a terrible meaning. I think they're like hatred or something like that. Um, And I know when I was doing research on this book, that was one where I cannot find any historical evidence as to why it means that way. I wonder if it was just someone who didn't like someone named Petunia, or if they just didn't like that flower who came up with it and put it in the floral dictionary, because it really could be anything. But essentially, when I was going through and writing the book, I would try to follow the most interesting thread. And so you do run into flowers that have different meanings. But when I was doing the research, I would think, 
okay, well, what story goes with this? What can I trace this back to? And essentially, that would be the meaning that I would try to stick with and explain in my book. You've made me think that I wonder if Aunt Petunia, I think, is that mm-hmm. Harry Potter? Like the evil oh, yeah, aunt? yes. And she's the evil aunt. Yeah. Yeah, wonder, yeah. All these things. Do you know of any scientific or psychological studies that explore the impact of flowers on human emotions and communication so that they go a little bit deeper? Yeah, there's one that I um, found out about when I was writing the book that I think is so fascinating. Um, And so we mentioned briefly um, rosemary for remembrance. And so ancient Greek scholars would wear these little crowns of rosemary when they were doing their exams because they thought it would help them remember their studies. And there are recent studies that show rosemary can help with um, memory loss and your cognitive ability. And so it's really incredible to think that this flower that has been used since ancient times actually does help with that. And then there's yarrow, which means a cure for a broken heart. And I believe it is used in heart medications of some kind as well. And so there, there's different uses and things as well in healing plants and herbs that are used in modern medication and modern medicine as well. Do you have a book on that? There must be one. My dad is a physician. And so when he went through and read my book, he was pointing them out to me. And I mean, Foxglove is comes from Digitalis, which is Digitalis, the heart medication. He was like, yeah, that's what that's used for um, in some doses. And so it's he would be pointing those things out to me. And I was just like, this is fascinating that all of these herbs that we that we think of having these old fashioned meanings and these old stories and myths like there's a reason why these myths exist and why they've lasted for hundreds of years and it's that flowers have a use outside of just being pretty or being used to communicate see and that's a whole other podcast as well like medicinal mm-hmm. herbs I've yeah. I've recently moved to a house with a with a nice sized garden and mm-hmm. an area to grow things and I'm really keen to grow plants and flowers that have not only smell beautiful but have real mm-hmm. healing qualities as well absolutely yes yeah Absolutely. That's what I'm trying to do too. It's tough here in Tennessee. It gets very hot. And so I have to be so careful with herbs, especially because they just want to wither in the sun. What else can you tell me that I haven't asked? Uh, I always try to remind people not to feel too bad if their flowers have a negative meaning. And so, you know, there might be more meanings to choose from if you stumble across it in my book and you don't like the meaning, you know, and you can also just invent your own take what a lot of florists were doing at the time and just decide a meaning that's better suited for you. I'm Mm -hmm. all for that. So, I mean, it seems to me that there can be a real link between perfumery as Mm -hmm. well. Have have you heard much talk about that? Have you seen that in action anywhere? Like, especially with the orange blossom, for example. I Mm -hmm. asked because I've just started a diploma in perfumery to go along with my wine stuff and and the fact that I love using my nose Mm -hmm. but I really like the idea of perhaps working on a on a formula that blends different meanings of flowers at the same time I love that idea that would be so cool there's a book that I love I think it's called the secrets of botany I think Jill McKeever is the author um, and she's a perfume artist really and she is from I believe Kansas City and My publisher also published the same book. I think it is The Spirit of Botany. I've talked to her a little bit about it and a little bit about um, the meaning of flowers and how that can influence perfume. And what's really interesting in perfumery is just like how much flower is needed to make like a scent. Um, I think she was telling me about like the thousands and thousands of like roses that you would need to make like a, a rose scent. And I love that. It's just, it's fascinating. Hmm. I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about that as well. Mm -hmm. So floriography really is a place that brings all of these wonderful things together, you know, the Mm -hmm. smells, the medicinal herbs, beautiful illustrations, flowers, uh, the lot. So tell people where they can find you. Yes, you can find me online on Instagram at Jessica S. Rue. Jessica Rue was taken, so you got to put the S in there for my middle name, Susan. (laughs) Um, And then you can find my books um, in any bookstore through your favorite indie bookstore, especially. It's always great to support those. There's actually a floriography coloring book coming out in the fall, which is exciting. I believe that's available for pre-order. And then the second book in the series is coming out, and it's going to be called ornithography and it's all about the hidden lore and myths of birds so we're kind of expanding into like a whole other secret language soon there's a a secret language of birds 
Yes, yeah. Um, so essentially, there's not as much of a history like floriography as there are with birds, but we do have the history of like Roman augurs and auguries, like looking into what birds were doing to kind of divine meanings. And it was used in wars and things like that, um, and making decisions for emperors. And it's interesting too, because we have so many myths about birds, so why not give them meanings based on the myths in the same way that Victorians gave meanings to flowers based on their myths and uses? Wow, okay. Yeah. Ha -ha. Let's yeah. keep talking about that one. <laughs> what else has a secret language? We were thinking about doing maybe fungi next. I think it's a great time for mushrooms. I mean, functional Thanks mushrooms over here have gone mad. That book by yeah. Merlin Sheldrake and Tang. I love Tango. that book. So interesting. You know, me, me too. I, yeah, mm -hmm. that's the next step. Gosh, uh, brilliant. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. Please let us know if you're ever in the UK. I mean, how, how amazing would it be to do like a Victorian style event mm -hmm. in the Isle of Wight where yeah. I live? <laughs> yeah. I would love that. And I mean, the history of gardening in England is fascinating too. I mean, I watch Gardener's World every week. So I, <laughs> I try to like, you know, learn as much about it as possible and try to incorporate a lot of British gardening and cottage style gardening into my own garden. So <laughs> it becomes really addictive the more that you garden. And gardening also is really good for your mental health. There's a lot of studies that show that as well. And so I know I definitely find it helps like reduce anxiety and stress when I'm out like pulling weeds and planting things and, you know, harvesting the fruits of my labor. <laughs> and just being around green, it's so, it's mm -hmm. so very important, is it? Absolutely. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, well, I imagine working on all these things just must be terribly good for you. The writing, so. the illustrating and the subject matter as well. Well, well done on this. Floriography is absolutely gorgeous. And I look forward to taking a deep dive into the other books as well. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. But for now, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. What do you make of that? Yeah, I love the the secret language of it. I love that you can represent how you feel. I, I find it funny. I like I like it when she talked about the hidden fuck you in a bouquet of flowers. And it kind of made me think about being able to tell the world something without having to be that, you know, explicit. Like kind of the opposite of, you know, those baby on board badges that you wear when yeah. you're in the underground because you can't see your bump yet. I'd quite like the idea if there's like a flower equivalent you can just wear that's just sort of like, I'm menstruating, fuck you, leave me alone, kind of thing. <laughs> you know, I think I think there is, because I had exactly the same thought. Like, is there a please don't talk to me, I'm just over people kind of flower? But apparently the yellow carnation has a meaning that's a little bit like that. It's about rejection and disdain and just like a give me a moment. Weird, because isn't a red, have I made this up? Isn't a red carnation what, you know, in the old movies, you used to put in your lapel and a paper under your arm to like, meet me at the station, I'll be the one with the red carnation. It was either a carnation or a rose, but yeah, I seem to think it was a carnation as well, which then makes me think that, is there a flower you could just wear generally, like if you're single and wanting to mingle, but you haven't actually arranged that blind date with somebody just yet, so it's not going to be a carnation. <laughs> what would it be? Or would it be a flower or would it just be a mini skirt and cleavage? <laughs> <laughs> Well, is the modern translation? Yes, but play the game. <laughs> uh, okay. I reckon something quite Georgia O'Keeffe orchidy, you know, quite vaginal, big, big open leaves. I'm ready. I'm ready for your seed. Do you know what? I would, I, I'd actually thought foxglove, which I guess is kind of similar. Digitalis, because you could put your, you know, someone could come up and put their finger in. Hang on. That's <laughs> You're basically just telling the world, I'm ready for fingering. I am open <laughs> for business. <laughs> but the thing about foxgloves is that's exactly what you want to do when you see them, even though apparently they're poisonous, so you've got to be careful. But you do want to just put your fingers in them, hence digitalis, right? So um, I think that's a good, it's a good conversation starter, at least, especially if you're wearing a massive foxglove plant when you're going out. <laughs> I mean, just if you're, to be honest, nowadays, if you're wearing any kind of fresh flower, that's just a conversation starter, isn't it? Because you don't really see it around. Not yeah, No one wears them unless you're going to a wedding, really. What's also cool is, it, I kind of feel like, excuse the pun, you could weed out all the shit. Because like you say in the interview, 
Yes, it's a language, but not everyone knows it. But if you're into it and you've got your like kind of secret code on your lapel and if someone else clocks into that, you automatically know that you found your tribe in a way. It's like, we can be friends because you knew what I was trying to say. And it just gets a lot of small talk out of the way. So going back to the flowers that basically tell people to like fuck off and not talk to you, there is also the be more gentle with me because I'm having a bad day, but I might like a bit of attention flower, which is apparently the lily of the valley or a white poppy. But I've never seen a white poppy, so I'm going to discount that one. But, you know, actually, I went round to mum's last week and she had some lily of the valley by the door in a little pot. And I'm now wondering if it was a message because, she knew, you know, she wouldn't necessarily say it out loud, would she? Oh, well, come and look after me. Come and be gentle with me, but I'm not going to say anything, but I'm feeling very delicate. Lily of the Valley. Oh, that's the thing. I, it, it, this kind of reminds me sort of in the world of crystals as well, where there's, you know, meanings have been attributed to them, haven't they? Like emotions and also the combination as well, because I'm pretty sure that with crystals, you can make a grid and you like use a different one to elevate the power of the other. Whereas the combination of flowers in a bouquet can mean something different. So it just reminded me of that. Yeah, it's, it's more like um, a whole paragraph instead of just a single word. Yeah, I would love to know who came up with these. Who found out that this was good for that one, that was good for that one, that was good for that one, and yet billions of people around the world seem to agree? Well, that, uh, that is, I think, where crystals and flowers maybe differ. And yeah, because I thought this, because essentially Jess is saying that someone at some point made this up, you know, quite unashamedly. So for me, it's less about, is this fact? And is, does that really mean that? It's more an insight into what was going on in that era. Like she said, like in the Victorian times, you know, we weren't as obtusely emotive like we are right now, for example. Hello, right now, this podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just a more subtle way of getting those emotions across because it wasn't the done thing just to spout out and say your truth. So I just think it's a nice snapshot of that time and like an almost... The actual act of creating this floral dictionary is a historical timestamp in a way. Not necessarily what it's saying, just the fact that it exists. Yeah, and she really does that so beautifully in the book. I think that real old world quality really lends itself to that as well. It does feel like that snapshot of Victorian times. Very English as well, it feels. There is a real English influence in her, or British English influence in her work. It's really gorgeous. Like, definitely check it out. Very William Morris-esque as well, a lot of her illustration, I find. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it, if you like that oldie-worldy style. Yes, there's notelets, cards, all sorts of things, isn't there? And she's got the fact she's got some more books coming, I mean, if I were her publisher, I'd just be lining them up. I love the idea of a bird one. Yeah, oh God, yeah, The Secret of Birds, we're going to be, you know, we're going to have a podcast where we're outside and it's just bird song. Oh, we definitely will. And what sparked joy for me this week was actually finding that there was basically a Shazam for birdsong. Because there are lots of birds. <laughs> what? That is the funniest thing I've heard in a long time. They don't call it that. <laughs> but that's what it is. You're like, oh, what is that lovely tweety thing in my garden? And it tells you. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with that yesterday, like an old woman. Yeah, really did. It's <laughs> <laughs> just so good. I need to do that. That is amazing. Was it right? It, yeah, it was right. Um, and funny, Cora wouldn't shut up at one point when I was trying to listen to what I thought was a thrush. Um, and it came up eventually with human. <laughs> <laughs> human with thrush. <laughs> but yeah, I just have, it really made me laugh though because it's like, okay, it's right. We've been analysing the sound and the bird you've got is human. <laughs> Oh, I love it, I love it. Is there anything we can't analyse the fuck out of? Love no, it. and that's why Flockenheim exists. <laughs> because it's for all that weird shit. Um, one thing I can't get out of my mind is, is the kind of men not squaring up to people in the pub and trying to fight them, but, but giving them a little um, leaf of basil, by the way. <laughs> like, do you think that ever happened? <laughs> Oh my god, yeah, you've got a, like a, a bar brawl and someone comes up with some lucky heather or something. Like, and that's absolutely going to change the energy. That's so funny. But there does seem to be a lot of confusion about the basil because it, 
in the Victorian times, it properly apparently conveyed hostility and uh, the anger and just that you really, really didn't like somebody, which I just giving them a plant to do that is quite interesting. But in other countries, it's exactly the opposite of that. It's a symbol of love. I mean, what if you really hate an Italian? What do you do there? <laughs> <laughs> it's about the intention isn't it it's not just this flower represents that I think if you load it with the intention that message will come across is what I is what I picked up from what she was saying a bit like how in like past podcasts for example with Christina talking about feng shui it's a lot about what you put into it as well which is how it then determines its meaning yeah I suppose if you wrap it up in a nice little bow it's a symbol of love if you throw it at somebody's head it isn't <laughs> but, but given that it was apparently the smell of basil which um, a lot of people don't like which is why the meaning became quite negative in Victorian society I just think they've confused that with something else obviously to me they're talking about coriander which is vile but basil is lovely to everyone isn't it uh, it's not a thing for people to not like the smell of basil is it well I don't know why you've got this hang up on coriander because I in my in my world people like coriander too. You're just really weird. Yes, I think I remember you saying something about you've had a bad childhood experience with it. And of all of all bad childhood experiences to carry trauma from, I think yours is pretty niche. <laughs> it was it was traumatic. Okay, so for listeners, we were on holiday in Greece. You were 10, I was 14. I accidentally licked a beetle. Right, And it was accidentally because we were having lunch and something fell on my hand and I thought I'd dropped a bit of the salad I was eating. And so I just licked it off my hand. It wasn't. I looked down and it was a beetle, which I now know was a shield bug because that's yeah, I remembered what it looked like. But it tasted exactly like coriander. And therefore, every time I've smelt coriander since I thought it was a beetle somewhere and that was going to eat a beetle and it was coming back for revenge. But... Ugh. Yeah, that's why I hate it. But also, it's not just me. It's a gene. If you have a certain gene, it means that you're particularly sensitive to aldehyde chemicals, of which, you know, you can find those in coriander and in soap. And so a lot of people either hate coriander or love it. It's not, you know, it's a well-known thing, cilantro, if you're American. But coriander can do one. And I'm not alone. Okay, and couple that with Rocket, because your husband has a visceral reaction if you even show him Rocket. He calls it the devil's pubic hair. Mm. I'm going to send a bouquet of Rocket and Coriander <laughs> to your house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. There was a meaning of a flower that I found that I quite liked, that I think could be useful in this day and age, and that's a yellow rose. Imagine that you've, you, you know, you've got to know somebody and there could potentially be a relationship there from one of your side. And you want to communicate that you really like them and you value them as a friend, but you don't want to have intercourse with them, basically. I could have done with that a lot in my 20s. But again, would rely on that other person to get the fucking memo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. You need a whole nation to learn the language, really, don't you? Yeah. Oh, but, you know, it's good that culture's changing now, isn't it? But unfortunately, yes. you, uh, you're at that point when you were trying to be an actress, you were absolutely neck deep in that horrendous, I'd say casting couch kind of expectation, but it sort of was, wasn't it? Oh, it was 100% that. Yeah, that's why I stopped being an actress, because I was so kind of naive with it, like enjoying people's company. And there's every single time without fail. Uh, and then it got awkward. Yeah, not good. And then they not didn't good. help you out with your career. No, they didn't. No. I did get my teeth shaved once, though. <laughs> <laughs> but that's probably a conversation for another time. Well, at the risk of going off on another properly mega tangent gone, I don't know what I'm going to tell you about my personal life next. I think it's time to wrap up this episode. And be sure to tune in next week where we have Louise Henning talking about the rise of the HSP highly sensitive person approximately 30 percent of humans are hsps highly sensitive people and in at a time when we need more empathic leadership it has never been more important to take notice of this part of society so we'll be breaking that down next week and probably all having a breakdown next week because <laughs> three three hsps in a podcast what does that make 
Don't forget there are lots of articles related to everything that we talk about in these episodes on our website, flockandhive.com, and you can follow us on social medias at Flock and Hive. And also, please remember, if you're enjoying the podcast, to like and share with everyone. Plaster us all over the place and bump us up the charts, please. That would be lovely. Thank you very much. So until next time, ta-ta. Bye.